Good morning. We're working our way through Paul's letter, second letter to the Corinthians. One thing we're learning is that, or in the Bible as a whole, there's only one source of transformation, and that's the glory of God. The glory of God is a way to talk about what it's like when God reveals himself to us, when God tells us about his thoughts and his purposes. It's like light, and as God reveals his thoughts to us, it's like turning a light on. And what we see in the Bible is that divine glory transforms those it shines upon. And what Paul does in this letter, we've just been looking at it over the last several weeks, is he contrasts old covenant glory and new covenant glory, and we'll review those in just a minute. But what he describes when he thinks about the influence of the light of old covenant glory and the influence of the light of new covenant glory, they are not the same. They're very different. What he says is that the, let me see, see if we can, old covenant glory versus new covenant glory. And in terms of old covenant glory, it says the letter kills. It has a destructive influence, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But what it says about new covenant glory is the spirit gives life. There are very two different experiences. And what we find in the Bible is that God initiated old covenant glory, but never meant that it would be permanent. Look what it says. By coven calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what's obsolete and aging will soon disappear. These two covenants, they cannot be in operation at the same time. If the old is in place, then the new isn't. If the new is in place, then the old one isn't. And what we hear here is when Jesus inaugurated the new covenant, and he did that at communion, which we'll celebrate a little bit later in the service, that initiation of the new covenant caused the old one to pass away at that time. There are two expressions of glory. Um, if you look biblically, there is, this is an image of Mount Sinai. And what happened at Mount Sinai, you're, you're aware, Moses went up on the mountain and received commandments from God that reflected kind of a glory. And, and we'll see about what ended up happening when Moses came up on the mountain. But when Paul describes the impact of old covenant glory, we just saw, it said the letter kills, and he talks about this. And we'll have to understand what this means. It's a ministry of death and a ministry of condemnation. And when we see the influence of the new covenant, it's very different. It's a ministry of the spirit and a ministry of righteousness. Let's look at the difference briefly, the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. There's a couple different kinds of covenant. What a covenant is, it's an agreement. And there are different kinds of covenants. One is a covenant between a suzerain. Now, again, this is an agreement or a contract between nations or countries or people. That's what a covenant is. It's like a contract or an agreement. And again, there's two different kinds. One of them is a suzerain vassal. Now, if you've got a couple kingdoms and one king is more powerful than another king, his kingdom is more powerful. The more powerful king would be called the suzerain. And the less powerful king would be called the vassal. And the reason a vassal would want to make an agreement with a suzerain is because their little nation might be threatened by someone in some way. And what the threatened nation would do, they would turn to a stronger king, a suzerain, and they would make a covenant with the stronger king. And this covenant would involve at least three things. It would be a commitment on the part of the suzerain, promising that he will protect the vassal if the vassal and his kingdom get attacked. 
So there's the commitments, but then there's commandments. What the suzerain would tell the vassal to do, you need to do these things in order for me to keep my promises. And a lot of times those things meant you have to give me so much gold a year or you have to provide me with this. So there was commitments on the part of the suzerain, commandments that the vassal had to comply with, and then there were consequences. In this kind of covenant, if there was, if there was obedience, then the, um, the vassal would experience blessings. If not, then the vassal would experience curses. That was a suzerain vassal covenant, and this is what the old covenant was like. Who's the vassal? Who's the vassal? In that context, it was particularly the Israelites. They met with God on, and who is the suzerain? God. Okay, what were the commitments? God said he would be with them, he would provide for them, he would bring them to the promised land. He made commitments to them, right? And because it was a suzerain vassal covenant, there were commandments, right? And there were actually more than 10, you could summarize them into the 10 commandments. And what that meant then, God says, I will do these things. These are my commitments. What you'll need to do are these 10 things, which really ended up to be about 713 things. And they were the commandments. And what God said, if you obey these commandments, you'll be blessed. If you disobey these commandments, you'll be cursed. That was a, that's what the old covenant was like. There was another kind of covenant that kings would make with less powerful nations. Let's say a king who is looking to be merciful. He's looking to benefit someone. What he might do is establish a divine grant covenant. Let's say you are the kings and queens of nations surrounding me, I am a very powerful king. Say, I just decide that I want to extend some commitments to you just because I feel like it. My kingdom is very powerful. So what I would do, I would call you together and say, okay, tell you what, this is what I'm going to do. You are kings and queens of nations surrounding me. I am going to benefit you in these ways. And you might ask, what do we need to do? What are the commitments? And I'll say, it's not that kind of covenant. This is not a suzerain vassal covenant. I'm not doing this because you came to me. I'm doing it just because I want to. What do you need to do for me? Nothing. Nothing. It's a divine grant. I am just going to extend these things to you. Um, would you agree? Those are very different. And the divine grant that God makes with us, that's the new covenant in which God says, I will put my law on in your minds and write it on your hearts. I will be your God and you will be my people and I will cause you to know me and I will forgive your wickedness and remember your sins no more. So, there are no curses in the new covenant. There are no, if you, you'll be blessed. And if you don't, you'll be cursed. Because it's not a suzerain vassal covenant. It's a divine grant covenant. And it's very different. It's, it's something that you can just receive. God commissioned Paul to tell people like us about the new covenant. If you were raised Jewish... There really were two kinds of people in the world. There were Jews, and then there was everyone else. And everyone else was called Gentiles. So Jews were Jews, and Gentiles were non-Jews. Um, most all of us are Gentiles, I would imagine. And what God commissioned Paul to do was to tell individuals like us about the new covenant. And he took this responsibility very seriously. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 4. We'll just work our way through these verses. That's what he writes. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. 
but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Well, Paul's saying because he had good news to share, he was really open about everything. You know the way it works with advertisements where something really seems too good to be true? You know, like you get this free thing and or this insurance and it's only $15 a month for $500,000 worth of term insurance and you say, wait a minute. And then you know the way it is with the end of those commercials. You know, it says, hey, and this, hey, and this, and then it goes, hey, you know, and you know, you know, there's all these disclaimers, you know, if you have two eyes, this doesn't apply. If you're living at the time you hear this, it doesn't apply, but you don't, you know, there's all this, this stuff that, that it's kind of hiding it, isn't it? It kind of reels you in or what they're talking about sometimes with those things that, um, Phishing, I think they call it, where these deals come into your email and you click and you don't get a deal, you get an ordeal. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But so if, um, but what Paul understood, because he really had good news, he had nothing to hide. And nothing to hide. He was really open because the good news of the new covenant, it doesn't have a lot of it's just, it's just God making commitments to us. And if we hear them and understand them and think about them, they start to change the way we think about things because glory transforms. And when we make room for new covenant glory, it gives us life. It changes the way we think about God and about ourselves. I got a... Um, if you, if you have a really bright light, it doesn't need to be pretty. This is a, this is a work light, not very pretty. It's not supposed to be pretty. What it's supposed to be is bright. I'm not gonna shine this on you because it's not good to shine these kind of lights in your eyes. But when a light is powerful, it doesn't need to be pretty. If this was a light that wasn't powerful, maybe we would wanna decorate it or put things, but a functional light, and what Paul understood, he was a little bit like that. If you, what Paul understood, if you have a brilliant message, you don't have to be a brilliant messenger, right? If you have a really strong, powerful message, you don't need to be a really strong, powerful speaker or a really strong, powerful messenger. Paul didn't need to be popular. He didn't need to be a good athlete because he had a really powerful message. He didn't have to tell really good jokes. He didn't need to use really persuasive words and be a really good orator. Because the message was so good, he didn't need to look and sound good when he spoke it. Right? The message of the new covenant is very powerful. And he understood that he didn't need to be powerful in order for the message to be. He didn't alter his message to make it more pleasing and to make it more agreeable. Uh, some couldn't see the difference. And it's kind of interesting between new and old covenant glory. Now, they seem pretty different, don't they? They really do seem to be different. But some couldn't see the difference between them. And Paul will write that some were blind. Look what it says in verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What Paul has been talking about, he's been talking about Moses on Mount Sinai. When Moses went up on the mountain to talk with God, God's glory shone on him, and when he came down, his face was shiny. And so what he did when he came down to talk to the people, he put a veil over his face. 
And now we might think of why he would do that. Actually, there, there are two possible reasons. Okay, here it is. Here's one reason. If this is a really bright thing, now if I was to shine, I'm not going to. If I was to shine this in Taylor's face, that would not be a good thing. What I might want to do if I wanted to shine it in Taylor's face is to put a veil in front of it so she, her eyes don't get burned. And that might be a reason why, because it was like Moses' face was like this light, and, you know, you don't want to look directly at this. And so what might have happened, Moses might have put a veil over his face so that they couldn't see the light and they, they weren't hurt by it to make his face less shiny. Um, there was another reason Moses veiled his face. What ended up happening, when he went up on the mountain, his face, his face was really glowing. And he came down off the mountain and he talked with the people. And while he was talking with the people, what the glory was doing, it was already fading. It was like those things that are glow in the dark. You know, we've talked about that. You shine it in the light, you turn the light off, and it shines really green. And then after a little while, it's a little bit less shiny, a little bit less shiny. And that's what was happening with Moses' face. And perhaps he thought that was a problem. You know, if we were standing there looking at him, is that me or is his face getting less shiny? It looked like it was 100 watts and, and now it's looking 80 watts. And geez, you know, is, is that what's happening? It looks like his face is not as shiny. So to keep people from seeing that, what he did was this. He put a veil over his face. And so now if my glory is fading, you can't see it, right? You can't see it. You, and what would you assume? The glory is the same, right? You would assume that the glory is the same. Now that, okay, now so what's the point? Um, the point Paul is making is that the glory on Moses' face, it dissipated for a reason. Because what God was communicating by that, the glory of the old covenant was not meant to be permanent. It was supposed to fade because it was supposed to be replaced by the glory of the new covenant. That's why it faded. And so when he's putting it now again, it, he was trying to do something good, but it really didn't allow people to see what they needed to see, which is his face is fading. And the point would have been, maybe if they would have gotten it, that means the covenant that he's talking about, the you're blessed if you do these 10 things and cursed if you don't, they assumed that those were still the ways, those were still the rules God operated by. Um, they couldn't understand that the glory had been replaced by the new covenant. Why? And again, when we're looking at the time, Paul is describing that a lot of people at his time couldn't see the difference. It seems really different, doesn't it? Would you agree? Seems different. A lot of people couldn't see the difference. And why? And he describes it. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. That raises three questions that we've got to figure out. Three questions. And, we'll, and here they are. Number one, who is the God of this world who blinds the minds? That would be a good thing to know, right? Who is the God of this world? Secondly, whose minds did he blind? That would be a good thing to know. You know, who is the God of this world? Whose minds did he blind? And what does it mean that their minds were blinded? The first two questions, those are a little bit sticky. Let's deal with the third one. That's a little easier. <laughs> third question is easy. What does it mean that their minds were blinded? And th what it means is they couldn't see that the new covenant had eclipsed the old covenant. The glory of the new covenant is like the glory of the sun. And if we were 
meeting and it was really early and the moon was shining the moon would look really bright if we looked at it and if it was dark outside but then as the sun came up can you see the light of the moon when the light of the sun comes up you can't because the light of the sun is that much brighter and it's easy to see but what's happening though the old covenant had given way to the new and people couldn't see that the new had eclipsed the old. They were blinded, not in their eyes, but in their minds. And that's what it means that their minds were blinded. Um, they couldn't see that Jesus reflects what God is like. What is God like? What does God like? What doesn't God like? What kind of people does God move towards? What types of people does God keep at arm's length? The answers to those questions are summed up in what was Jesus like? What kind of people did Jesus move towards? What kind of people did Jesus keep at arm's length? Because Jesus reveals what God is like. With Jesus, we can see God's face. We can know what God agrees with and what he doesn't agree with. Okay, let's think about Jesus. Think about him. Think about the stories you know about Jesus. What kind of people did Jesus have problems with? Jesus ever get angry? Jesus ever get angry? Yeah, he really did. Um, what kind of people did he get angry at? A uh, couple of verses in the Bible that it's written out. Let's look at a few. John 3, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. There's a world of sinful people. Everybody who doesn't do what God wants, does God hate the world? Does he? No, it says he loves the world. He didn't come to condemn the world. Now, let's look at another verse, which is going to say he did come to condemn, but not people in general. See if you can catch it. Who is it that Jesus came to judge? He didn't come to judge people in general. Look what it says in Luke John 9. Jesus said, for judgment, I, have, I came into this world. Do you understand what's happening? In John 3, he said, I didn't come to judge or condemn the world, the same word. Here he says, for judgment, I did come. Wait a minute. Is Jesus making a mistake here? No. Look what it says. For judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. Do you know who Jesus had issues with? If you didn't claim to understand what Jesus was, what God was like, and if you said, you know what, I got a lot of questions, Jesus would have no problem with you. If you claimed to reveal God, like the Pharisees who were religious professionals, they were telling people, this is what God is like, and they were getting it wrong. It's not that they had questions, it's that they claimed to know the answers and didn't. That made Jesus angry. When someone claimed to reveal the Father and misrepresented him, that's a problem. Because the way people think about God is going to influence if they're able to have faith in him or not. Jesus didn't like it when sheep were misled. And that's what made him frustrated. He doesn't condemn those who he condemned those who claim to reveal God but were unable to do so because they 
They couldn't see. Would you agree? Come this way. Let me lead you. No, come here. Let's, let's take a walk. If I go, okay, no, I, I know. I know I can't see, but I'm sure I won't stumble. Yeah. Would you understand a blind person is going to have a hard time being a guide? And that's what, that's a problem. When those who claim to guide people to God can't see them. Because it says in Matthew, the eye, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. The eye, when you think of the eye, it's easy to think of it from a body. But let's think of it in terms of people. If the one claiming to speak about God, he is like a seer, right? A seer. He's like an eye for the body. If, let's say I am the seer, and if I talk about things, but I can't see them. And if your thinking about God is coming from me and I can't see, you see the problem? You see what's going to happen? If the eye is not clear, what's going to happen to you? You're in a lot of trouble. If you need to depend on me seeing, and I can't. And that's that's what Jesus is talking about. And look what it says in Matthew 15, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They're blind guides. If the blind leads the blind, if the blind leads the blind, both are going to fall into a pit. That's why Jesus didn't like misrepresentation. Because it didn't just inf influence the person making the claims, the people following, they were going to get into trouble as well. Okay, third question, what does it mean that their minds were blinded? That, that makes sense, maybe. Okay. Yeah. First question, who is the God of this world? That's a little tougher. A lot of people assume it's Satan. They believe that Satan keeps people from seeing what God wants them to see, that God is shining light, and that Satan has the power to keep people from seeing light. So God's reflecting light, and Satan is kind of poking you in the eyeball so you, so you can't see. Um, the only problem is that this makes Satan more powerful than the Bible says he is. Satan is not a god, and frankly, I don't think Paul would have called him one. I'm, I'm thinking the God of this world, I don't think he's talking about Satan. But let's, I, I, I don't think Satan is as powerful. Look, look what it says. You know what happened in Job? Remember the book of Job? God was meeting with the heavenly council, and Satan came into the council. And what it says in Job 1, I'll just read it. Um, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. He was talking about Job, and God says, boy, Job's something, isn't he? And, and, and Satan said, oh, yeah, sure, he's something, because you bless everything he does. And then, the, and then, but if you stretch out your hand, he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. What, what God says, I give you permission. Okay, you can touch Job, but not his health. Touch his goods, and that's what happened. And then Job did fine, and Satan came back. And God says, hey, how about Job, huh? And, and Satan said, but, you know, you, he's healthy. And God said, okay, you can make him sick. What we see then, the devil had to ask permission, right? He had to ask permission. It's not that he was an enemy that did what he wanted. Jesus had the same view. Look what it says in Luke 22. It's in your worship folder. Jesus is talking to Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. That word demanded, what it really is, it's a, it's some people when they look at the Bible said, well, they can't mean asked.
but that's what it means. It's the word is asked, but the persons who interpret the Bible indicated it must be demanded because God would never allow Satan to do, but the word is asked. Satan asked to sift Peter like wheat, just like he asked in Job. Tell you what, if I ask permission of you to fight with you, that's not much of a war, is it? Um, if you're not doing anything today, you know, if, if, if it's not too inconvenient, I'd like to come over and, and attack you. Now, I know the Super Bowl's on, so maybe I could attack you uh, before the Super Bowl, or maybe I can wait till it's over. Or if Kansas City loses and I'm attacking Shane Holtman, maybe I could attack before the game's over. If, if, it's, if it's not too much trouble, I'd like to shoot a bullet at you, if you don't mind. That's not much of a war. Satan doesn't have the authority to do whatever he wants to you. That's why I don't think it's... It asks a question. So, who is the God of this world then? Um, I don't think it's Satan. I think it's God. The God of this age is the God of this world. Is There's only one God. And it's God Almighty. Okay, I think the fact is that God blinds minds, not Satan. Oh, well, that's really good. Let's pray. Let's pray and close. God blinds everyone. Okay. Yeah. Um, but look what it says in Romans 11. What Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain, but the elect did. The others were hardened. As it is, look what it says. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that so that they could not see, and ears so that they could not hear to this very day. Who blinded their mind? Who gave them a spirit of stupor? Satan? Satan? No, God Almighty. He's the only one that can blind minds. So it doesn't seem that God tries to get people to see, and Satan pokes them in the eyes. He just isn't that powerful. He can't, be, he can't frustrate what God's doing. Okay, that's interesting. We, there were three questions. Um, who is the God of this world? I think it's God Almighty, not Satan. Um, what does it mean that he blinded their minds? He couldn't see that the light of the new eclipsed the light of the old. That leaves one question, and then we'll talk about that, and we'll have communion. Whose eyes did he blind? This is a good question. Is God going to blind your eyes so that you can't see? Would you agree with me? It's probably pretty important to know whose eyes he blinded. Who's he talking about? That's what it says. Look at Romans 11. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be aware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Whose eyes were hardened? Let me show you. Okay. Let's divide. Let's make a world here. Okay. You guys are Gentiles. You live east of Israel. You guys are Israelites. I'm going to divide you into three different groups. You are in the west. You're the east. You're the Gentiles. You're the Jews. And there are three different people groups in you First three rows, you guys are the ones that live near Jerusalem, and you are very devout. You really follow the rules. You live near Jerusalem. You guys in the middle, uh, sorry to say you're Samaritans. These guys hate you. You're just, you don't have much status, so let's get right past you, and, and, if, and let's go to the you guys in the back. Now, you guys are too, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm sorry. You guys are in the north, aren't you? Is this the north? You guys are still Samaritans. Excuse me. You guys are the religious ones. You're in the south. 
And Jerusalem, where John and Abby live. And <laughs> so you guys are the Judeans. You guys are the Samaritans. <clears throat> you guys are the Galileans. Now, but you know what? That's kind of really good news. You know what God did? He blinded the minds of the Judeans and the Samaritans, and he opened the eyes of some, you. Do you know where Jesus was born? Where you guys live, in the north, Galilee of the Gentiles. Bethlehem, it's up in the north, right by the Sea of Galilee. Most of the disciples live where you come from. In fact, all but one did. Who's the disciple that comes from where you guys live? Judas Iscariot. He didn't do really well. Okay, now here's, here's what happened. You guys, you guys are a minority. The rest of the eyes, the rest of them has been blinded. Now, what I want you guys to do, ready? You're the Jews who live in the rest of... These guys believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They believe that the new covenant has been has replaced the old covenant, and they embrace you. How do you feel about that? You like that? No. Here's what I want you guys to do. I want you to let them have it. Boo! Get out of here. Go ahead. Yell at these guys. Come on. Come on. Come on. You guys, come on. Let's have it. Boo! You know what ended up happening? You guys are booing them. Oh, man, get them out of here. You know what ends up happening? I'm going to take, oh, Taylor, I'm always going to pick on you. I know, but it's not bad. No, in fact, I'll take all of you guys. Okay, all of you guys, come on up. Come on up. You guys, you guys, come on. You're just going to, I'm just going to, I'm not going to do anything embarrassing. No, I'm really not. So here's, you know what I'm going to do? You guys are the ones whose eyes I have, God has opened to the new covenant. And how do you feel about these guys again? And you know what ended up happening? Because they got that kind of reception, do you know where God sent you guys? I want you to go over here. I want you to spread the new covenant to these people over here. And you guys are going to hate them even more. Okay, thanks. Thanks. God blinded the minds of most of Israel opened the eyes of some of Israel and sent them so that Gentiles like us could know the new covenant. When the time of the Gentiles is over, and there will come a time where it closes, here's what's going to happen. He's going to put a stop sign and Gentiles won't be able to see the new covenant anymore. I'm not sure what will happen. You know, what's going to happen to you guys back there that God blinded? And, and you guys are going to see, Jews, that your eyes were blinded for a reason. God wasn't rejecting you. He needed you not to see so that you would kick these people out. What you're going to see is that God has never rejected you. God does not accept children and then reject them. Never. Never. And you're going to see it. At some point, Jews are going to see they weren't rejected, and it is going to be astonishing what's going to happen in their heart. Again, we don't know how this is going to happen. Okay, so what about us? Now we're all Gentiles again. You guys have turned from Jews back to Gentiles. Most of us are Gentiles, I would imagine. Okay, so God sent you guys, and these guys are long, long ago dead. We don't, now we kind of, so we see now. What should we do with this? What does this mean for us? If your eyes are open, to see how the glory of the new covenant surpasses the glory of the old, that glory, if you look at it, is going to change you. Glory always does. 
You, we have unveiled words, and we can behold them. Let me, me give you a, a word of advice. Get your gaze and glance right. Get your gaze and glance right. What are we to look at? That? Yes or no? This. Commitments. Gaze at commitments. Glance at commandments. Gaze at promises God makes to you. Glance at promises you make to God. Gaze at what he says. Glance at what you do. Don't spend your time analyzing you. You're not changed by looking at you. You're changed by looking at him. And his promises, it changes you. Glory always does. So if your eyes are open, gaze at him and his promises. Don't gaze at Satan. Some people are so Satan-oriented, he's everywhere. And you get the impression that Satan's as big as God is. Satan is a created being. He can't do anything to frustrate God. Don't gaze at Satan. Don't gaze at the commandments. Glance at them, but don't gaze at them. You're not going to be changed by gazing at the commandments, right? You're changed by gazing at his commitments. Gaze at God's promises. Gaze at his commitments. You know what communion is? Remember what Jesus said last verse? This is the new covenant in my blood, right? That's what he's talking about. You know what Jesus came to die for? So that we could have a new covenant. That's what this communion is all about. It's about a new covenant. So when I'm going to leave this up here. And as you go up into the back and grab the juice and grab the bread, you know what I want you to think about as you're drinking the juice and eating the bread? This represents, as you see the difference, and this is why Jesus wants us to practice communion. So we'll think about the new covenant, and we'll think about it, and think about it, and think about it, and think about it, and little by little by little by little it changes us. So I want you to think about the difference between the old covenant and the new, and when you take those elements, you know what I want, to th- want you to do? Do two things. Thank God for the new covenant And thank him for the Jewish hands that brought it into the world of the Gentiles. So I'm going to grab the elements that's back here, do that, and then take it sometime. I'm not going to tell you when. I'm going to pray for us. And then um, there's an article, and we cover a lot of ground this morning and good stuff. There's an article from 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6 from Vase for Grace. I include it in the worship folder. Read through that, scan through it. It'll reiterate and talk about some of the points that we made. Maybe then as you keep, as we keep on looking at this stuff and looking at it and looking at it and looking at it, it gets clearer and clearer and it changes us. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for um, sending Jesus and inaugurating a new covenant. You know exactly what you're doing. You don't make mistakes. And it was your intent to follow up a temporary provision with a permanent one, an eternal one, to begin with one and to supplant that with another. And so I pray that we would be able to understand what you're saying more clearly and be changed by it as we do. In Jesus' name, amen.